Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome on behalf of Radboud Reflex to this evening program on space wars, um, or uh, war theory for in space. Um, we're going to talk about this hot topic tonight, which you may have uh, read about in the media recently. NATO, of course, has said that space is now a warfaring domain. Uh, the United States has come up with this space force thing. Um, uh, or you may have read in, uh, about this in Trau yesterday, where Lonneke was interviewed. Um, we have Lonneke here with us tonight, Lonneke Paperkamp, philosopher of law, uh, who will be uh, giving us a lecture on the need for a, a legal framework for wars in space. Uh, why that's different from wars on Earth, uh, why it's needed now, uh, what the urgency is. After her lecture, uh, I'll, I'll have a, a brief interview with her, and then there is room for questions from the audience. So if you, if you have them, save them for uh, the last part of our meeting tonight, uh, and you get the chance to ask your questions. Uh, Lonica, the floor is yours. Right, so thank you for the very nice introduction, Frank. Um, I have to say, when you asked me to talk about this topic, I thought that I would be talking in a classroom at the university, so I'm uh, happily surprised to be moved to Lux Theatre and to see so many people here that are interested in the topic. So, um, welcome to all of you. And, um, and the other thing that I thought when you asked me was, it is a little bit early, we talked about this. This is a new project that I'm starting, and I think that it is a very exciting topic, and it's a very important topic, but I've uh, been working on it now for a little while, um, and hopefully in the future I will have um, uh, a lot of time to uh, write about this. So I'm very happy with the opportunity to share my first ideas about this uh, topic. Right, so we live in a time of a new race for space. So the old space war uh, started in 1957 with the launch of Sputnik 1. That was essentially a space race between the Soviet Uni Union and the USA. And today we see a new space race. So that is in uh, all sorts of ways different from the old space race, but I will talk about that more um, tonight. So. The current political developments uh, show a new interest in space, and not only in the military field, but in general. And that renewed interest in space comes with certain risks, and that is why I think it's very important to have clear rules to determine what is allowed in space and what is not allowed. So ideally, the revival of space should go hand in hand with some sort of shared idea of uh, the direction in which the rules should develop in the future. And the goal is, of course, to use space, uh, but to use it in a responsible and in a sustainable way. So that is the, the summary of, uh, of my talk tonight. And what I will do is first to give you a bit of context, so to sketch some developments, uh, also to we'll talk about the specifics of the space domain um, and the potential sources of conflict, and then I will give you a brief map of the, uh, of the normative framework, so the legal status quo, also the moral norms of just war theory, and point out some challenges for both of those fields, um, and then I will take a step back and consider the underlying values. Uh, and that might be helpful in developing um, a further uh, specific rules for space. Okay, so after land, sea, air and cyberspace, space seems to be and become the new battlefield. So from the beginning of human exploration, space has been a militarized environment. But you see uh, today that states are becoming more and more proactive when it comes to military um, space strategy. So there are different things that you, you mentioned it now also shortly, uh, different things that you might have read in the paper, so developments in the last, well, year or so. Uh, the NATO in December officially acknowledged space as a warfighting domain, so they are formulating an overarching policy for space. Um, and for now, at least, they are focusing on, um, on protecting their military assets in space. Trump, President Trump, of course, launched the Space Force that is being set up over the coming year and a half. Um, there are all sorts of countries that are developing uh, space weapons. So uh, countries are also testing ASAT weapons, so anti-satellite weapons. Uh, Russia, China, um, the USA, uh, Israel, 
all test these anti-satellite weapons. And India last year was the last country to test their own weapon. So this is to show the world what capabilities they have, uh, but also in doing so, they create significant space debris. So that is something else that you might have re read in the news, uh, the growing problem and very serious problem of space debris, junk in the orbits around Earth. We also see that satellites, so uh, uh, that is usually tracked when there are um, satellites being launched into uh, space. But there are uh, situations in which a satellite was launched and then uh, some piece broke off. We thought that that would be a piece of space debris. And then suddenly that piece of debris starts moving and move starts manu uh, maneuvering closer to other satellites, uh, what is called uh, close proximity operations. So it isn't really clear then what those satellites do and what the purpose is. So the risks and the stakes are high. Space is seen as the ultimate high ground with which to gain military superiority on the ground. And at the same time, uh, it might offer strategic advantage for militaries, but it is a vulnerability too, because uh, states then depend on space technology. So uh, satellites are vulnerable, so that strength can be turned into a weakness. An attack on a satellite or a collision with a piece of debris can prevent armed forces from, from flying drones, from uh, guiding missiles to target, from uh, determining the position of enemy troops, um, monitoring human rights violations, the occurrence of war crimes, uh, refugee flows. But it doesn't have only these military consequences. It can also lead to um, disabling of commercial aviation, of weather predictions, telecommunications, the phone stop working, electrical grids, um, financial transactions. Everything depends on space. So humankind has come to rely so heavily on space that the disruption of space infrastructure would have devastating consequences for life on Earth. So um, space technology is deeply ingrained in many of our daily activities. And yet you see that there is a troubling lack still of general awareness of the security risks that are involved with that. Oh, let me... Better late than never. Um, so, this is not only the context, the features of space, the specifics of the space domain. It's also relevant for the legal and for the moral discussion, because it shows that space is a very unique domain and that we cannot simply uh, apply the existing rules to activities in space. So first, there is a variety of actors. So compared to the old space race, in which there were only a few uh, space-faring countries, uh, today there are uh, a lot more actors in space and also a larger variety. So commercial players, the space industry is booming, and even for individuals, it is getting more and more easy to launch satellites uh, into space. The space field breathes interdisciplinarity. So um, there are a lot of questions and issues across different disciplines. So people working in the field are astrophysicists, uh, planetary scientists, engine engineers, uh, geologists, lawyers, philosophers, um, and all these things are relevant for the activities in space. The vital interests that are at stake, I've just talked about this. So a disabled satellite can have very severe consequences and could lead even to total chaos uh, on Earth. Then the dual use function of space assets. So that means that civilian and military space missions often uh, share launch pads, launch vehicles uh, and satellites. So these things are uh, very difficult to distinguish. There are also public-private partnerships. Um, but the same technology you see can be used for civilian as for um, military purposes. And it's also not always clear. So sometimes maybe on purpose it might be uh, the payload. So the payload is the function of the satellite, um, might be unclear. So that might be a commercial payload of a satellite, but that may hide an additional military payload. Space debris. So as I said, this is a serious problem and a growing problem. So I've looked up the um, estimates of ESA and there are around 5,000 satellites now, 
but only around 2,000 of them are uh, working satellites. So the rest of them is defunct, derelict satellites, and that is space debris too. It has no function anymore. But aside from these uh, satellites, there are also um, 34,000 objects larger than uh, 10 centimeters in, um, in space and about uh, almost a million, but that is an estimate because we don't track all of these uh, pieces between one and 10 centimeters. You see that here on, uh, on this video. So that is not only a problem because it is a pollution of space, but also because it creates danger for, um, for space uh, flights, for international space station, for working satellites. So it can collide with uh, these working satellites uh, and destroy them. But also debris can increase. So this is what is called the Kessler syndrome. I don't know if people here have seen the film Gravity, which starts with a kind of a dramatized depiction of the Kessler syndrome. But the idea is very real that pieces of debris collide with each other because of the speed at which they move in the orbits around Earth and that you get an increasing amount of space debris because they keep colliding and it keeps getting more. As of yet, we don't have a good solution to clear uh, that debris uh, and to, uh, to remove it from uh, the orbits around Earth. So there are plans for this, technologies are being developed, but we don't have, as of yet, a good solution for that. The next uh, uh, um, operation is Clear Space 1 of uh, ESA, and they are planning to do a big cleanup operation in 2025. The rapid development of space technology. So it's very difficult to assess what is a matter of science fiction and what is something that is actually feasible and will happen in the near future and therefore something to prepare for. So these innovative technologies are developing very rapidly. And then the last one, uh, of course, the absence of boundaries. So the lower boundary of space is unclear, so it's probably around 100 kilometers from the surface of the Earth where space starts, but there is at least no legal definition of um, that lower boundary of space, and uh, there's definitely no upper boundary of space, so space might be infinite, incomprehensible as that might seem. And also the lack of gravity, uh, the speed at which um, objects move around Earth and the general sort of inhospitable and dangerous environment of space make it a very unique domain. Then there are various sources of conflict. So uh, before I go into these sources of conflict, space is also a very good opportunity to work together. So it's often said that the uh, cooperation in the context of the International Space Station is quite a big success. Uh, but there are sources of conflicts as well. And I've talked about the militarization of space, um, but you see that uh, the increasingly dominant presence of states in space uh, and the aggressive language uh, that that might be a uh, cause for, or that might, that might stimulate an arms race in space, uh, so a space weapons race, and there are risks involved there in terms of tension and the outbreak of conflict. Crowded orbits, so the space around Earth is increasingly congested, not only because of the space debris that I've talked about, but also because of the amount of satellites that is being launched into the Earth. So you might have heard of these companies, SpaceX, for example. They, are, um, they have projects in which they don't launch one satellite, but mega constellations of satellites. So the idea of Starlink, of SpaceX, is that there will be 7,000 or even more satellites which form a constellation and which will then bring super fast internet in every corner of the world. It was also big in the news uh, last year in Holland because you saw this train of 70 um, satellites uh, on the night sky. So space is getting more and more congested. The colonization of Moon and Mars. This might sound like science fiction, but there are serious plans to return to the Moon and to go to Mars, not only of, uh, for example, uh, NASA, but also companies. So uh, you've heard Elon Musk uh, about, talk about the colonization of the Moon and of Mars. This is a tweet which is 
Uh, kind of funny, it went viral, not because it's dubious to say that you are going to colonize and occupy uh, territories, but because this is a picture of uh, a blood moon and not uh, really a picture of Mars. Um, Space mining, uh, there are all sorts of commercial activities and technologies that are being developed uh, that want to mine resources from celestial bodies. So there is a risk of a new gold rush in space and huge commercial interests. And then the last one, tourism in space, for example, Virgin Galactic is uh, focusing on this um, human space travel just for the fun of it. So there have been paying tourists that, are be, that are, have been brought to the International Space Station. There are new plans to bring tourists there, uh, but also there are commercial spaceports that are being built um, and companies that offer orbital flights, so flights that will make a full round um, uh, around the Earth, a full orbit, and suborbital flights, so flights that reach space, about 100 kilometers, uh, and then go back to Earth again. So you can see that unbridled, and then I don't even discuss the possibility of encountering other life forms, but you see this sort of source of conflict in science fiction movies. Um, unbridled competition, resource exploitation, uh, national rivals, rivalries, um, new sort of forms of imperialism, progressive weaponization of space, uh, you can see the risks that are involved here when these developments are actually going to happen in the future. So against the backdrop of today's rising geopolitical tensions, I think that these developments can lead to serious risks. And there are two sort of scary scenarios. And uh, those scary scenarios are related to the security risks and the environmental risks. So the first scary scenario is a wild west in space. So um, an area where the law of the jungle prevails, uh, might makes right, uh, weapons that are being used, no clear rules, outbreak of conflict, um, so all sorts of different security uh, threats. And the other one is a tragedy of the commons. So Garrett Hardin wrote a famous paper about this in 1968, in which he discussed a shared resource system. So um, a resource that is owned by no one but shared by everyone, be it a common field in which, in which um, um, animals can graze, or uh, the other uh, natural resources of the earth. But the idea is that when individuals act based on rational self-interest, that they uh, will use this common resource in a way without having an eye to the benefit of, of the collective. And in this way, they will overuse and spoil the natural resource, the global commons. And I think that that is a very real risk for space as well. So what we need is clear rules to govern military activities in space, maybe all activities in space, but this is uh, what I focus on. Um, and my presupposition here is that a complete, a full normative framework, I'm a philosopher of law, so uh, a complete normative framework consists not only of legal norms, hard binding law, uh, treaties, and soft law, but also moral principles. So more specifically, when you look at armed conflicts and war, uh, that is being regulated by international law and also by moral just war theory. So these legal and moral norms are not always complied with, but uh, generally considered to be valid and applicable to war and factored into military and political uh, decision making and strategy. So very briefly, the legal framework, and there is a lot to say about this, but I will go over it fairly quickly. Um, space law is a special branch of international law, and it consists mainly of five treaties, uh, and the foundational treaty is the Outer Space Treaty. It's now 53 years old, uh, but that contains the general principles that govern activities in space. And that contains, for example, uh, principles of the exploration of, uh, of space and that that should be done to the benefit of all countries. So space is free for the exploration and the use of all. Space is a province of mankind. There's a prohibition on placing nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction in orbit or on celestial bodies. 
space should be used for peaceful purposes only, so there can be no military bases on the moon, for example. And the moon and celestial bodies cannot be owned. So this is the principle of non-appropriation. There can no, be no claims of sovereignty uh, in space. Well, there are different other sources of law. For example, the UN Charter, general international law applies to space. And there's a law of armed conflict, which is uh, specifically tailored to uh, war and armed conflicts. There are other sources of law that are relevant, environmental law, telecommunications law, but this is um, most important for the topic that I discussed today. And then soft law. There are various binding, non-binding declarations and guidelines that are being developed. And uh, for this topic, the militarization of space, uh, there, is, there are two actually manuals now in the making. That is quite interesting. It's, it requires a little bit of uh, explanation. So this is more common practice in international law. Uh, specifically when you talk about uh, armed conflicts, that we have the law of armed conflict, but we see new developments in uh, the way in which wars are fought. And then a group of experts um, drafts a manual that is uh, seen as authoritative interpretation of inter uh, international law. So the application of international law to that specific issue. The, the Talon manual might be something that you've heard of, which is the manual that applies to cyber warfare. Well, a similar manual um, was initiated for the issue of warfare in space, and there was disagreement between the experts, uh, so there are now two manuals in the making, the Milamos manual and the Wumera manual. Um, and those will appear probably, well, this year, uh, but more likely next year. Then there is vagueness with regards to these general principles. So it's not clear what it means in terms of specific uh, legal norms. For example, what does it mean that space is to be used for peaceful purposes? We see that space is being militarized. Uh, and there is a, a, a legal discussion about this, an extensive dis uh, discussion. That, and there is a difference between the militarization of space, which is... Um, legal according to international law, according to uh, experts, and the weaponization of space. So space is used as a more supportive um, for warfare on Earth, but the unbridled weaponization of war uh, of space is probably illegal according to the Outer Space Treaty. So there is a fear that uh, space is being weaponized in the not too distant future. Some people say that it is probably already weaponized, but there is uh, some secrecy here, so we don't really know that. But it is the, the question is where what is allowed uh, and what is not within the context of pe peaceful purposes. What does the province of mankind actually mean? So this is a concept that is similar to uh, a global commons, such as the Antarctic or the deep sea. Um, and there is a tension here, so states have a right to explore, explore space, but it is also the province of mankind. So how do you use a common environment such as space? How should we perceive uh, the concept of sovereignty? So there can be no, no sovereignty in space, but the uh, charter of the UN applies to the domain of space, and that legal system is entirely built upon the idea of uh, national sovereignty and territorial integrity. So how does that relate to each other? And what do we do with the acquisition of property? So there are different companies that are exploring and investing in these technologies to mine resources. There can be no appropriation in space, but can these companies um, uh, claim sovereign uh, property rights over resources, such as water, uh, minerals, and um, metals. So also here there is a legal discussion um, and it's not really clear what is allowed in that respect and what is not. So there are different legal challenges you could say. I've talked about the vagueness and the gaps that has to do with the fact that the uh, specialized branch is quite outdated, uh, that there are developments that we see now that were not foreseen when the treaty was drafted, the Outer Space Treaty, for example, technological developments, the variety of actors, uh, the commercial actors, um, the problem of, of space debris. So you see that there is vagueness and that there are gaps here. 
There is no unitary legal framework, so that is the fragmentation of international law, which is a general problem, but also something that you see here in the domain of space. That leads to incoherences, so when different bodies of law apply, um, how do you interpret then the law? For example, um, how is the use of space for people, peaceful purposes, uh, how does that compare to uh, the inherent right of self-defense that is entailed in the UN Charter? What is the status of astronauts, for example? Would they engage in military operations in space? Would they be envoys of mankind to be protected by everyone that is entailed in the Outer Space Treaty? Or are they, according to humanitarian law, legitimate targets for enemy combatants? The third challenge is that there is a political reluctance to uh, subject to binding norms. So, because the stakes are so high and because obviously states have their national interests in mind as well, there doesn't seem to be much willingness to come to a new uh, binding treaty. So, the use of outer space for military reasons is a, a sensitive issue and states are reluctant to uh, subject themselves to legal uh, restrictions or prohibitions. So are the laws silent in the context of space wars or broader space militarization? No, they are not silent, uh, but they seem to be vague and, and outdated and a comprehensive and clear uh, framework that is coherent and tailored to the space domain, that seems to be missing. So there is a normative vacuum here. And that is the central problem that I would want to address in my uh, project. So the legal framework has not kept pace with military technological developments um, and there are various um, new guidelines that are being developed but that is all quite limited. So these guidelines focus on existing international law. We call that uh, the Lex Lara, existing international law. They are not focused on the Lex Ferenda, so the law as it should be. So taking stock, um, the problem that I've sketched so far is that there is a new space race that comes with risks and we need clear rules to prevent and mitigate those risks. And such a re regime seems to be absent. And given these risks and our dependency on space technology, that is a huge problem. So my idea at this point uh, would be that it is very important, vital even, to stimulate the discussion and to try and strengthen the normative framework by turning to moral principles. And so now I will move from the legal framework to uh, the moral principles. What can philosophy bring to the table here? I think for starters that, especially in times of legal uncertainty, these moral rules are very important. So since there is happening so much in the field of space, at this moment, it is important to have a discussion on the values and the issues that are at stake, so it can bring substance to the legal discussions. A clear normative framework will enable normative claims about the law. So, is the law adequate according to moral principles? Where are the gaps? What should be solved? So, it provides a yardstick, a tool to evaluate existing international law. It can also help to fill gaps and serve as uh, a source of interpretation of existing international law. And then grounding existing law in moral principles uh, will help to provide legitimacy, so increase compliance. When the law corresponds to what morality requires, it is generally perceived as legitimate and that increases compliance with the law. So as I said, these binding or non-binding guidelines, sorry, these manuals are focused on the Lex Lara. And I think that in this context, it's very important to focus on how the law should be, the le uh, Lex Ferenda. Which way should the law develop? Which values do we want the law to reflect? And what moral principles um, should, we, um, should we see as guiding principles for the development of space law? So in this way, it stimulates the development of international law and can show the direction in which the law uh, can or should develop. Now, just where war theory can be a starting point here. We don't have to start from scratch. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. When you look at moral theory in, in the context of war and armed conflicts, uh, just war theory is a very 
popular uh, and well-established field. So it's a subfield of political philosophy. Um, so it's a theory on the rights and the wrongs of warfare, essentially the morality of war. Uh, but given this, so you could say, okay, that's that then, we have the moral principles, but given the specifics of the space domain, I don't think also here that we can simply apply these moral principles to warfare and militarization of space. There has to be some sort of translation of those principles. And what you see in the few pa papers that I've um, uh, read about this topic is that there are two pulling forces, two sentiments, and those you see in just war theory itself as well. So on the one hand, there's an idea of uh, idealism. So seeing space as a sanctuary, as something pristine, a pristine environment that we have to protect for the benefit of mankind, and that is to be used only for peaceful purposes. On the other hand, you see the developments in the world today. So you see that space is in fact militarized and that it is used as such. And maybe um, the weaponization of space is something that is happening in the future and states are uh, just preparing for that. So we should maybe just go and regulate it. So you see these two pulling uh, forces. Then. Uh, just war theory, so just very quickly, because I can talk about this for hours. Um, so just war theory um, is a moral theory that um, gives principles, criteria, norms that apply to war. So it consists of three branches and it determines uh, when it is allowed to wage a war, use ad bellum, uh, when is waging war justified, Use in bello, so what is the appropriate, the, the right conduct in war, when the war is raging, how should soldiers behave themselves, and use post bellum, so how should uh, the uh, situation be solved when the war is over, how should we rebuild the peace afterwards. And there are moral challenges here as well, so what is a just cause for war? A just cause for war is the most important principle, arguably, of use post bellum. So it determines that there has to be a very, very good reason um, for war to be justified. Uh, Self-defense against aggression is the typical just cause for war. So just war theory is aggression-centered. And what is required for a justified self-defense is an act of aggression. So an unjustified military attack um, against the sovereignty of another state. But in the context of space warfare, uh, the scenario might be different. So what is probably the most likely act of space warfare is a cyber attack on a satellite. Is that an act of aggression against, states, uh, against which states can defend themselves? Um, so this raises the question as to what is actually at the heart of the concept of aggression. What is um, important here? And you see that the concept of aggression has sort of fuzzy edges. So there's a discussion in just war theory as to whether or not we should extend the concept of aggression. So maybe it's not about, well, necessarily uh, an army with tanks lining up at a border ready to march in, but maybe it's about uh, a violation of basic human rights of citizens. Or maybe it's an intentional attack um, that violates the basic interests of a state. What is exactly at the heart of the concept? And can an attack on a satellite um, rise to the level of the use of force? Is it potentially serious enough to justify taking up the arms? This is especially relevant in the context of the NATO uh, acknowledging space as a warfighting domain. So when is an act of space war um, serious enough to trigger the uh, Article 5 principle of collective self-defense? Uh, self when is it seen as an attack? What are the relevant actors? So, suppose there would be an attack on a satellite. Um, it is likely that when something, when a satellite is disabled, we are not really sure what the problem was. Was it some sort of technical problem? 
Uh, was it an intentional attack? Was it a collision with a piece of debris? Um, so it's very difficult when something would happen, in all likelihood, to attribute it to a certain state. So against whom should you defend yourself? And this is what you see also in just war theory and what is called the attribution problem. Sometimes it's very difficult to attribute certain actions to a state. The principle of discrimination. So how the principle of discrimination means that uh, soldiers in war need to discriminate between legitimate and illegitimate targets. And civilians, for example, can never be intentionally targeted. What does it mean, the principle of discrimination here? What are legitimate targets in space? So I've talked about the dual use purpose of satellites and space assets in general. It is very difficult to determine whether a satellite that is being used by the military, but also by civilians, uh, for example, GPS, um, whether a space system could be a legitimate uh, target. Also, there might be commercial satellites uh, who whose owner sells services to military branches. Could this then also be a legitimate target? And I've talked about the status of astronauts. So that is, it might be quite difficult to discriminate between legitimate and illegitimate targets. And then the last one, the proportionality. So proportionality is a principle uh, that is important in just war theory and it involves uh, a balance between estimated costs and benefit. So is the good that the war will do or uh, the prevented evil, does that weigh up to the negative consequences of, uh, of a war? Or in the war, when the war is raging, um, is a specific military attack worth it in terms of the military advantage uh, weighed against the costs in terms of casualties, destruction, uh, costs? So those are proportionality calculations. And that is also probably difficult to determine when it comes to space warfare. So how does the creation of space debris weigh into these calculations? Or how should we weigh a violation of, of interests of the population, maybe economic uh, damage that is done uh, by a cyber attack in space? So these are the moral challenges when you look at the principles of just war theory. And we need, therefore, I think, to take a step back and to consider what the underlying values are. So the law of armed conflict and just war theory uh, aim to limit war and to make warfare as humane and least destructive as possible. So it aims to limit the uh, negative consequences of war. The underlying values are that uh, it is about the protection of collective and individual human rights and the avoidance of unnecessary harm to humankind. But this is very much an, what we call anthropocentric view. It's very human-centered. We consider only the value of human beings. And what is important is to consider what the relevant moral community is. So, maybe in general, but especially in the context of, of this topic, uh, we might want to expand our perspective. So expand the circle of mor moral worth. What do we integrate into moral uh, considerations? So, so far we have been focusing, as we mostly do, on the interests of us, human beings. What rights are infringed upon, uh, what interests are damaged, what uh, sort of damage is allowed in uh, achieving a certain goal. But given the specifics of the space domain, I think that there are other things to integrate into these considerations. So the first step would be to broaden our perspective and to consider future generations, so future people. This is a matter of intergenerational justice and I think um, so there is a problem here in philosophy, it's called the non-identity problem. Uh, Derek Parfit showed that it is quite difficult to uh, see how we can have obligations towards future people. Um, but I think that it is possible to say that we have obligations not to unnecessarily harm future generations. And the second step would be to consider the environment itself. So uh, there might be inherent value, but this is a bit more difficult argument to make, I think, in space itself. 
So the extraterrestrial environment, and given that space is uh, uh, infinite, we might want to focus here, I think that is easier, on our solar system. We know that we are part of our solar system, uh, we have a, quite a clear view of, uh, of what the solar system is. And I think that there might be reason to, uh, to think that there is an inherent value in protecting the solar system for its own sake, so not only because it is instrumentally valuable to us human beings. So I'm inclined to think that there is something to such an argument, and it ties into seeing space as a sanctuary. So there might be something inherently wrong with polluting space and contaminating space. And you see in, uh, in the field of environmental ethics that this is a, a, a quite a well-known thought example. So uh, suppose that there are a few people left on the Earth. They would be very angry, they would be resentful, and they would decide to destroy the whole place. So they would bomb the Alps, they would poison lakes and rivers, they would spray napalm on forests, um, just for the fun of it, for to destroy it. And they wouldn't feel bad about themselves because they wouldn't harm anyone with that anymore. There would be no one left to enjoy uh, nature. So when there are intuitions that this is something uh, intuitively wrong, it indicates that there is a uh, value in protecting the environment um, for its own sake. So this is the last imagined act. And I think that maybe when you share the intuition that the ecosystem or the Earth, uh, the environment on Earth is something to be protected for its own sake, that maybe we can extend that to the solar system. So suppose you would adapt this so a thought experiment a little bit. Um, and it's not too far-fetched because I read about uh, garbage. We tend to export our garbage to Asian countries so that they can recycle everything, but they don't want that anymore. So last week it was in the news that Malaysia is sending back all this trash, all the garbage. They've son sent tons of garbage back to the European Union, to Canada, to the USA, because they don't want to be the world's rubbish bin anymore. Suppose that we would be able to send the rubbish out into space. So there would be some far corner of the solar system, we could dump all our rubbish there and we wouldn't use that corner of the solar system in the future. We would never be able to use it so we wouldn't come across it anymore. Problem solved. I don't know about your intuitions, but I would think that there is something wrong with that intuitively. Um, and so I think that that indicates that it is worth protecting the environment uh, for its own sake. And when something is intrinsically valuable, such as the solar system, perhaps, that generates a prima facie duty to protect it. I don't know how it weighs. Maybe it doesn't weigh up to the interests of the whole global population, but there is probably some value um, there. So what I think is that we might want to broaden the underlying values. So the next step would be to assess how that all plays out in operational specific norms, uh, but that I still have to do. So um, I think that strengthening the underpinnings um, and stimulating the discussion and focusing on these underlying values, that, that can help with the development of the normative framework and that this can show the direction of future uh, developments. Waar waren we gebleven? In Noordwijk. Oeps. Um. No. My last slide. So, I'm not a CAN specialist, uh, unlike some of my colleagues, but this is a very um, suitable uh, quote, I think, from the Critique der Praktischen Vernunft, so the Critique of Practical Reason. And in this uh, passage, Kant says that two things fill the mind with ever more an increasing admiration and awe respect. Uh, the more often and steadily we reflect upon them, the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. So he further writes that 
the first regards him standing in the limitless magnitudes of world upon worlds and systems upon systems, and the second begins with his invisible self. But at the same time, he can see them both very clearly. They are not some sort of veiled obscurities, he writes. So I think that Kant's time was totally different, of course, and the sky was generally uh, pristine then, uh, but this is a quite a nice way and a thought-provoking way of thinking about this. Maybe in this time of uh, the exploration of space and the militarization of space, we need the moral law within us to regulate activities in space. So, while doing justice to our ideals and um, considering this moral law within us, we still have to be um, realistic uh, in terms of what we can achieve and between those two, val those two values, there has to be some sort of uh, balance. So this might be an attempt to find a way to use this domain, but in a responsible and a sustainable way. Thank you. <laughs>